now. I feel like I've I've drank the lava of Mount Doom. <laughs> Hey, what's going on, everybody? For First We Feast, I'm Sean Evans, and you're watching Hot Ones. It's the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. And today we're joined by Elijah Wood. He's been in more than 60 films over the course of his more than 30-year-long acting career from Academy Award-winning indies to one of the highest-grossing box office film franchises of all time. His latest project, though, is No Man of God, which is set to release in select theaters and on demand August 27th. Elijah Wood, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is a real honor. And you know, I've heard this story secondhand, but I'd like to just bring it to you directly. Okay. So as I understand it, you were doing an interview or a podcast on this floor, yes. in this building, yes. see the hot one sauces on display, and you're like, out of curiosity, I'd like to try those out. Is that more or less how the adventure starts, and then where does it go from there? More or less. Uh, I, yes, I didn't realize that Hot Ones was filmed in this particular location. So when I got here, I was like, oh shit, I've always wanted to be on the show. Man, that would be amazing. And they were like, well, if you want to try some of the, the hot sauces just as like a, a separate little like internet bit, we can do that. I was like, sure, let's do that. And so we tried a couple of sauces, including this one here, the bomb. I'm very familiar <laughs> with this. The friend and colleague who I was with is Tim League, who created the Alamo Draft House Theater, which you may know. He then has a very severe reaction to this sauce, to which we <laughs> the ambulance was called. <laughs> I'm outside, my friend's doing better, having a conversation with some of the people that work on the floor. And I start to get this warm sensation in my stomach that just continues to grow and grow and grow. And I thought, oh shit, and this is it. And I ended up also on my knees in a severe amount of pain. Well, respect for coming back to try it again, <laughs> Elijah. You Thank ready you. to get started? Yes. Oh, it's fantastic. Heat with heart, it says. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. I mean, that's a, that's warm. It's nice. So your new film, No Man of God, chronicles the interviews between serial killer Ted Bundy and FBI agent Bill Hagmeyer, yes. who's credited with coaxing the criminal confession out of the campus killer. Thinking back on the real life consultations that you actually had with the real Bill Hagmeyer, what interested you most about the chemistry or the psychological interplay between FBI agent and serial killer? Oh man, I think the ability to be in a room with someone like that and find their humanity to a degree. So it's, it's one thing to go into that room looking for information from a psychological standpoint, which is what Bill was doing. But it's another thing entirely to also see that person as another human, which he also had to do in order to have those interactions for Ted to feel safe, to be able to express and sort of reveal the things that he needed him to reveal. We know a lot about Ted. That was a thing I didn't know. I didn't realize that there was this agent that had spent this kind of time with him over the course of the four years prior to his death. Yeah, and like, the, like calling him his best friend and stuff like that. Ted literally said that he was his best friend. And I think, you know, for Ted, the reason why he considered Bill his best friend is that unlike other FBI agents and law enforcement whom he didn't trust, it's because those guys had an agenda. More often than not, he assumed that they would go off and write a book about their conversations. Bill never did. And I think that's why he, he trusted him and why he considered him a friend at the end, because he didn't come in with an agenda. He really wanted to understand. Well, that's nice. Artisanal chili sauce. So beyond the frozen pizza aisle, I know that you're somewhat of a gourmand, and you're oftentimes taking pictures of ramen and then researching the restaurant scene fanatically wherever you go. Yes. If you had a food obsessive visiting you in Austin, what would be the most mouthwatering itinerary you could put together? Like the best breakfast, lunch, and dinner move you could make in that city? Breakfast tacos um, at El Primo, uh, which is a, a taco truck on um, South First Street near Mary. Pizza Via 313 for lunch. It's probably my favorite pizza in the world. It's a Detroit-style pizza. It is exceptional. And then dinner, ramen tatsi is incredible. Uh, that would be a, a great one. Their shoyu ramen is amazing. Uh, the tonkatsu is incredible. And they have uh, a slider that is a pork katsu slider that is the stuff of dreams. 
It, 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 honestly, if I could eat one every day, I would. It's a, it's a pork katsu, very small. It's on a little, little slider bun with um, a kind of coleslaw, and it's just phenomenal. Do you have an all-time favorite Elijah Wood movie scene involving food? The uh, hot sauce and lime scene in The Trust is, you know, special for me personally. That's a very good one. That's a very good one. Involving food. I, I mean, you've sort of stolen it. That's a great one. That's a great one for a couple of reasons. One, it's opposite, opposite Nicolas Cage, which was, for me, the first time as an actor, genuinely, that I had an out-of-body experience working with another actor. And I remember being in scenes, conversing with him, and he would say something to me, and I would think in my brain as I'm acting opposite him, oh my God, that's Nick Cage. <laughs> the way he said that was like so like Nick Cage. Oh my God. So, one of my favorite experiences as an actor was working opposite him. He was a delight, and to get to see his creative process was a joy. Um, and that scene is hilarious. So yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. You really kind of made the answer perfect. Oh, intensely spicy, just one drop hot sauce. Fuck, that's good. Mm -hmm. Way These more are than also one drop. very good wings. Shout out shorties. Hey, shorties. <laughs> it's your birthday. So at this point, I know that you've done more than your fair share of necropsies surrounding Lord of the Rings, but on this wing, what we want to do is fact check some of the fables that have made their way onto internet message boards and into the headlines and just fact check them somebody, with somebody who has boots on the ground. Great. Is it true that after winning 11 Oscars at the Academy Awards in 2002, yeah. you, director Peter Jackson, and the crew ditched the traditional post-show celebrations to instead go to a Lord of the Rings fan party that yeah. was put on by the One Ring website? Correct. Yeah, we went around to a couple of parties and then we ended up there and spent the majority of our evening at the OneRing.net party. It was truly the end of the journey for us. Being able to then go back and celebrate with the fans was the only thing to do. And nothing against the Vanity Fair party and those sort of, you know, events. They're fun, but this was like, it didn't have any of the pressure of the fanfare. <laughs> right. We could just hang out. And it was really nice. It was really nice. Maybe you're privy to this, maybe you're not. Is there any truth to Peter Jackson orchestrating 20,000 cricket fans between inning breaks to put on the sounds of the Yurikai army? Whoa. Is that a thing? I don't, I don't know if that's true. It would most likely be rugby, because rugby's really the game. In New Zealand? In New Zealand. I mean, they do play cricket, but I feel like ru the rugby crowd is a far more boisterous crowd than cricket, I would have thought. But I could be wrong. I've never been to a cricket game. It's a weird one, isn't it? It is. It goes on for days. <laughs> goes on for days. And sometimes it's a tie, and no one wins. Three fucking days. And then finally, is it true that you let out the fart heard round the Shire doing a hillside <laughs> roll with your Hobbit cast First mates? day of filming. <laughs> day one. Uh, so yeah, we're in the scene is um, we are rolling down the hill after uh, Mary and Pippin run into us, running away from Farmer Maggot's field, having stolen a bunch of vegetables. They bang into us, we roll down the hill. So it's picking up that moment of falling down the hill and falling on top of each other in a very comedic way. And I think it was like take two, and I, I had a a, a, a con, what is that a a concussion fart a a <laughs> fart that is uh, brought on by pressure and yeah I literally fell <laughs> and everybody burst out laughing it was great it was very funny <laughs> it's a hell of a way to start filming Lord of the Rings you got to announce your presence somehow I have to say all of these have been delicious that one has a kind of sweetness to it and a little barbecuey sort of flavor yeah. to it a kind of smoky barbecue that's what we're that's what we're going for kind of like that a is. summer sauce like a, a slow roasted meats or like like grilled vegetables kind of hot sauce that's great love that one so you're the voice of Spyro the Dragon, likewise made an appearance in God of War, and yes. then a few years ago were hand-selected by Microsoft to unveil the Xbox 360. Yes. <laughs> As a video game obsessive and someone who I'm sure <laughs> thinks about these sorts of things, yeah. is there a game that you think is especially ripe for a screenplay adaptation? The universe of GTA lends itself beautifully to a screen adaptation or a TV show. Um, I mean, I think Vice City could be amazing, although that already is sort of inspired by Miami Vice. But GTA V, I mean, the kinds of characters that are present within the context of that game very much lends itself either to a film or a TV series. That would be amazing. 
Another thing that's happening in the world of video games in terms of adaptations is they're going back to um, uh, Resident Evil. Yeah. And I'm very keen on that because the, the original Resident Evil, whether it's your thing or not, is very different from the game from an aesthetic standpoint. It was always a shame to me that they didn't lean on the sort of world that had been established in the game. And I think that's coming up, which I'm very excited about. Well, you know, speaking of that, you know, games like Silent Hill or Resident Evil, mm -hmm. sometimes they can be a more frightening experience than even the most suspenseful thrillers. Totally. Like, psychologically, what do you think that they can do that maybe films aren't able to? Well, it, it's an immersive experience. Um, unlike a film which is passive, you are a participant in the game. You were playing the character. There are moments playing sequels of Silent Hill that were genuinely disturbing to play. You're not sitting back and watching something. You are making the choice to go down that hallway. You are making the choice to, you know what I mean? And I think in that sense, there's a, there's a level of suspense and sort of within the context of the interactivity that makes it maybe more scary. All right, Ginger Goat. The original goat. Yeah. I feel like the habanero like kicked us into gear and then we've kind of been coasting a little bit. Yeah, the, the three in this season is a little jarring and then it does downshift a little bit. It's nice though. But it's about to kick back up. <laughs> Enjoy that feeling while you can. Right. <laughs> Great, I'm not gonna, I don't need water yet. I'm all right. All right, Elijah, we have a recurring segment on our show called Explain That Gram. We do a deep dive on our guest's Instagram, pull interesting pictures that need more context. So we'll okay. show you the pictures over here on the monitor. Right. You just tell us the bigger story. And in preparing for this interview, I read a little bit about force perspective and motion-controlled camera rigs. Oh, yeah. Can you give us one piece of cinematic wizardry that really blew your mind when you actually saw it in action on set? A thousand percent. So there's a scene at uh, the Bag End kitchen table, and it was split um, into two pieces where he was, um, Ian McKellen as Gandalf, was sitting at one portion of the table, and I was sitting at another portion of the table. And scale appropriate elements were at either table. And the table would move along with the camera to make sure that the angle was always appropriate to make him look like he was sitting in front of me and I was sitting opposite him. And I'd look at a tennis ball. So anytime Ian was talking to me and we're having the scene play out and we're talking to each other, I'm looking there and he is looking opposite him at a tennis ball. And in camera, it looks like we're sitting opposite each other and he looks giant and I look small. And that was incredible. And there was also the cart. So when I jump into the cart at the very beginning of the film, when, when Gandalf's coming into the Shire for the first time and, you know, you're late and a wizard's never late. Uh, they arrive precisely when they mean to. Frodo jumps into his arms and then they're sitting opposite, or they're sitting side by side, going through having a conversation about, you know, Bilbo's party and so on and so forth. And that was a similar thing. I was sitting behind him, and he was sitting in front of me, and the camera was set at such an angle. We were going back to real basics in regards to the magic of cinema. It was awesome. We also had scale doubles. So for any wide shots, there would be, there were um, people that we had, um, uh, many of them that were that size. So about th three foot eight, three foot six. Um, that would be our doubles for anything wide, and they would wear masks. That would have, like, your face on silicon it? Silicon masks with our face, <laughs> but the, ma the masks wouldn't move. Excuse me. So that was a bit jarring, because you would see someone walking around with your face, but it was inanimate. It was just <laughs> in a fixed position. <laughs> Made in Tucson. The old tux in Arizona. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There it is. A bit of like a hot curry vibe. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and the um the peppers are sitting right on top. Pretty hot as well. Oh, that's good. So I know that you have a deep connection to scary movies. It's a hobby that began when you were a child. Yes. And then it's grown into you co-founding SpectreVision in 2010, a production company that focuses on horror movies. Mm -hmm. What can you tell people about Truth or Dare, A Critical Madness? Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> Sir, you've done your research. Um, Truth or Dare, A Critical Madness. It's one of the first horror movies I remember seeing. It's a great, the movie is about a guy who, who's uh, at the very beginning of the movie, he catches his wife sleeping with his best friend uh, and colleague. Um, and then he, he freaks out, has a, a pretty traumatic reaction to it and leaves in a huff. 
Uh, and then he goes on this road trip and loses his mind, and he, he uh, picks up a hitchhiker. And she says, would you like to play Truth or Dare? And he's like, yeah, okay, Truth or Dare, all right. Play Truth or Dare, and it goes from, like, throw your wallet in the fire, you know? Uh, pretty intense thing, but all right, he's, you know, he's on this journey to cut your tongue out. It's sublime. It's so great. The performances are, are not good. <laughs> it's just, I'm, I got a warm hug all over right now. It's great. <laughs> so this I'm, is really fun. You're having a good time. I'm loving this. All right, number seven. I'm waiting for you, man. All right. All right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, when you get to that level, that kind of like, I know that, I know that flavor. I know what's up. I know what's about to happen. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying by that. Like, I, I'll know when something's a super hot from like, the second I the smell first, it. Yeah. Yeah, the scent and that first, yeah, that first taste on your taste buds. Wow, that's good, man. <laughs> that's good. Now we're, now we're cooking with gas. Yeah. There we go. I'm always curious with an actor who's as prolific as you are, is there an under the radar project that when a fan brings it up to you on the street, it maybe hits you emotionally a little bit differently? Yes, that is such a great question, by the way. That is not something that I hear often, but it, it is in relation to a reaction that I often have, which is when someone brings something up that isn't as common as say Lord of the Rings, which is obviously the most common thing. Uh, there's a couple, um, Over the Garden Wall, is a big one. Um, it was an animated miniseries on Cartoon Network. This sort of beautiful 2D animation style that feels very much like it evokes something from the past. It's really stunning. Grand Piano, that still remains one of my favorite experiences working on a film. And on the production side of things, uh, I get really excited when people uh, reference The Greasy Strangler, because that is not something that many people have seen. And it's a polarizing movie. It's a movie not for everyone. And so when people are enthusiastic and have seen the movie, I get very excited because I think it's incredible. You recognize that wavelength of that it's, person. It's a specific wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> and I am very much on that wavelength, yeah. All right. It is that time. Oh, fuck. All right, here we go. Back. <laughs> All right, Tim League, this one's for you. Avenging. Yep. Okay. There's a sort of dryness to it. It sort of feels like someone's dusted it with hot pepper. That's a good way to put it, because that's how I feel right now. I think I inhaled oh. in just the right way. Oh. And just, yeah, caught like a pepper buckshot right in the esophagus. Oh, yeah, I mean, I definitely had, yeah, right in the back. Oh. I'm just, oh, this is gonna suck later. <laughs> it really is. So I know that you have a passion for music, yep. DJing for more than 10 years, and over that time, built up a massive vinyl collection. Mm -hmm. What's the last retro 45 that you bought off eBay? Mm. I'll tell you what, the hot sauce really fucks with your brain. It does. And its capability We've of being able to answer, which is really where... a clever aspect of the show. <laughs> See what you've done here. Um, yeah, you've really kept the interview on its toes. Um, The last 45 that I bought was actually a Kanye West 45. Washes in the Blood, that's the name of the song. Wow, that is really fucking hot. That's... That's weird, because I've had that before, but maybe not so much. I think I only had like a little dab last time. This is a whole wing, it's like... What's fascinating, what's happening right now, is that it actually... I feel like the capillaries in my face are on fire, and maybe that's also because I touched my face with that. Yeah, I think I did too, mm -hmm. around my nose. We're, we're suffering together in this. How about, oh, yeah. of all the original pressings wow. that you own, wow. which one required the most time and effort to track down? There's a 45 from a, a Welsh band called Bran. It was like a psychedelic Welsh brand band that I've had a difficulty tracking down, and that's very good. <laughs> and I have that now. Wow. Yeah. And that's not even the end. That's great. <laughs> this is great. Uh, 
But this is why we do this, you know? We go, this is why we go through it. Yeah. The experience. <laughs> well, I may have, I may not have actually physically thrown a ring into Mount Doom. <laughs> but now, I feel like I've, I've drank the lava of Mount Doom. Yeah. <laughs> Apologize, there's so many burps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once you've like destroyed your mouth, everything everything's else. just like, whatever, <laughs> more of the same. <laughs> you know, you've lit the fire, right. the fire's going. It can't get hotter. No, it's an inferno. <sighs> So in 2006, you were ranked number seven. This is my favorite part of the show. Is like, and we're back to the interview. Let's <laughs> let's try and let's try and break synapses fire and communicate with your mouth. An autograph collector magazine's list. Yeah. Of the ten best Hollywood autograph signers, what's your guiding philosophy <laughs> when it comes to dealing with the autograph hounds of Hollywood? <laughs> this is so flattering. Um, with autograph hounds specifically. Yeah. Oh, bud, that's a tough one. Um, because there's a there's a separation between fans who genu genuinely want to meet you and have an autograph, and then the people who collect it and sell the photos. I know what's going on, but I can't bring myself to say no because I don't want to be a dick. Sometimes they they can make it a excuse me a bummer for fans because they'll crowd a space and oh, you know yeah. if there's a if there's an event. That people know that they're gonna be there. There's loads of fans, but then there's also tons of autograph hounds that'll have like multiples. And that can ruin it for people who care. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. But I'll always sign because I just, you know, I, I like to be nice. <laughs> it's hard for me to be a dick. I don't want to be a dick. All right, Elijah Wood. Oh, is this the last down? <laughs> hey, it's the last dab. This is a this is a hot session. I feel like. I'm I'm noticing. I'm seeing you react yeah. more than I feel like I've ever seen you react, which I'm honored. <laughs> just for you, Elijah. I'm honored. Just for you. Oh, did I do was that too much? Someone just said, oh God, what did I do? What did I do? Yeah, yeah. They've been we've seen it all before. Okay. Ready? <sighs> Cheers. Cheers, my friend. Nostrovia. <laughs> What's the story with the last dab? So Smoking Ed. Oh, is this a, a creation of his? Yeah, so this is made with Pepper X, which is his next generation Reaper, but it's just Ed growing it on just this farm. He's a fucking so madman. We we got in with Ed to get like the Pepper X and just make this sauce with it. That's rad. So that's the last dab, yeah. That's rad. That's, um, yeah, man. <laughs> But again, I think once once you're once you're primed, I mean, this is beautifully curated. I must say, it's like it's like a symphony, you know. <sighs> starting off really slow. I mean, maybe it's like a little single cello here, and then you just keep adding elements and elements. And this kind of there's a ramp up. I mean, it's beautiful. It's like a conductor. And this guy, I mean, this is like Stravinsky comes in with the fucking. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's intense. And but once once that starts, I just don't feel like. This was the absolute destroyer. Yeah. This is when things were brought to a new level, but I'm there now, so I'm like, well, fucking whatever. I, last dab? Well, you, you know, know what I mean? Like, you're primed. You're you're sort of, it. I feel numb. Elijah, it's because, you know, maybe it's because you see through this whole thing, but that really uh, connected with me, really spoke to me, because that's what we try to do. We actually call it a spice symphony. You do? Yes. Hey! It, internally, behind the scenes, and then the other thing about it is, you know, we do think of it like a story arc. Yeah. Like once we hit this, we do want to kind of land it a little bit. Well, I don't even just, know if you, you can. You can't be on a on an ascent the and whole And then time. just crank, 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 roll you credits. Can't. No, like, you can't you don't do wanna that. Do that. No. You got to land the plane. You got to land the plane. Yeah. Oh man. And this is a beautiful way. To... <laughs> <laughs> this is a beautiful way to do that. <laughs> this has been awesome. Oh, we're not done yet. Well, you know what? I had a question, but I don't even know if it's, you know, because this was such a beautiful conversation to encapsulate the experience yeah. that I almost want to just like Call snap it. it off right there. 
for okay. Elijah Wood, who's somebody who's who's seen the show, watched the show, experienced a practice run of the show, yes, and now sitting down for the real thing. Yeah, this has been really fun, and I am honored, and I have been a longtime watcher, and uh, this is very cool for me. This guy, old trusty, forever the benchmark. <laughs> In the show for years, wow. and it had to stay here because it had to be here for you, Elijah Thank you. Wood. Thank and you. look at you taking on the Hot Ones gauntlet, conquering it the second time around, <sighs> this time with some stakes and a few million witnesses. And now, right. Elijah Wood, there's nothing left to do but roll out the red carpet for you. This camera, this camera, this camera. Let the people know what you have going on in your life. Um, well, you can, you can, yeah, you can go see uh, either in theaters um, or on demand a movie called No Man of God about Ted Bundy and his relationship to Bill Hagmeyer, the FBI agent. And I'm about to make a film uh, with a certain Macon Blair called The Toxic Avenger, uh, which will be super fun. We work together on a movie called I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore, which I, I adore, uh, and he is remaking uh, Toxic Avenger. So we're going, I'm about to go shoot that. Camera guy Bill, I can't tell you how hyped he is. He Namaste. was talking about that. Namaste. This is awesome. Thank you so much. It was really Great fun. Great job, Elijah. Thank Great you so job. much. Is there someone that, has anyone vomited? Not like on set, but, but we've had some people like, where's the restroom, like on cut or like yeah. whatever. Or yeah. like people are like, I need to take a break in the middle or something like that. And I don't know what they do. You sure. Know? sure, 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 sure. Hey, what's going on, Hot Ones fans? This is Sean Evans checking in with a quick reminder. The Hot Ones Season 15 sauces are currently available at Heatness.com. That's right, Heatness.com to get your hands on the Season 15 hot sauces. I know you're sitting there, you're wondering at home, like, oh, it can't be that hot. I think they're overdoing it. They're exaggerating. I've had spicy before. I can do it. Well, put it to the test. Now available, Heatness.com. Heatness.com to get your hands on the Season 15 hot sauces. Be careful around the eyes. 